Welcome to episode 60 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to retired agent Rick Hahn, who served in the FBI for 32 years, six as a clerical employee and 26 as a special agent. Throughout his career, Rick was involved in terrorism cases, either as a field investigator or as a forensic specialist in explosives. Rick is interviewed about the extensive investigation of the domestic terrorist group known as the FALN, a Spanish acronym which in English means the Armed Forces of National Liberation, an extremist organization advocating for Puerto Rican independence through acts of violence. The group, active in the 1970s and early 1980s, was credited with committing more than 100 bombings that caused several deaths, multiple injuries, and millions of dollars in damage. Rick Hahn also talks about the formation of the first official Joint Terrorism Task Forces, JTTFs, in New York and Chicago. The FALN was and still is America's most prolific domestic terrorism organization. In 1984, United States Attorney General William French Smith awarded Rick with the Attorney General's Award for Distinguished Service for his efforts in disrupting and dismantling the FALN. A documentary about the investigation will be released later in the year. The film is based on a non-fiction manuscript written by Rick Hahn. This was a fascinating case review of a domestic terrorist group that I really didn't know a lot about. But the old TV show FBI Files featured this investigation, and there'll be a link to that video in the episode show notes. Before we get to the interview, I just have a couple of things that I want to let you know. The first is that we are still in the middle of March Milestones, which is my giveaway celebrating two milestones during the month of March, my 60th birthday and 500,000 or a half a million episode downloads of FBI Retired Case File Review. Thank you for listening. To commemorate these milestones, everyone who subscribes to my newsletter will be automatically entered into a drawing for a chance to win one of two prize packages. The prize package includes a signed copy of my novel, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry, a display ornament celebrating female FBI agents, a Philadelphia FBI challenge coin, a Philadelphia FBI lapel pin, an FBI retired case file review, and pay-to-play bookmarks. This contest closes at 12 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday, March 31st, 2017. After the interview, I'll give you more details about the rules of the contest, but you can enter by going to my website, jerrywilliams.com. And that's J-E-R-R-I williams.com. The other thing that I want to say is thank you to Michelle Simpson and to Deborah or Deborah Sutton for reviewing Pay to Play on Amazon. Reviews help other readers find good books. So thank you so much. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're helping me to continue to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. Plus, as you can tell from the great reviews, Pay to Play is a good read. So keep the reviews, tweets, posts, and emails coming. I love hearing about how the interviews with retired agents inspire, encourage, and educate you about the FBI. Thank you. Now here's the show. I'm excited to introduce my guest, Rick Hahn. Hi, Rick. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. I've interviewed a number of retired agents about their domestic terrorism cases. 
the Al Rukin and uh, Unabomber, and now I'm talking to you about the FALN. I didn't know a lot about this group. I had heard the name, and I knew that they were for Puerto Rican independence. So before we even get started about the actual case and investigation, can you give everyone a little bit of a history of Puerto Rico's independence, this group, F-A-L-N, what does it even stand for? Well, it stands for the Armed Forces of National Liberation. The liberation movement started in Puerto Rico in the 1880s, actually, against Spain, long before the Americans had any, any dealings with Puerto Rico. As a result of the Spanish-American War, the Americans took Puerto Rico as a spoil of war, established a government there, and that government uh, became the target of the same independence movement that had targeted Spain prior to that time and uh, continued up until uh, the time that they really gained independence in 1952, uh, at which time they became a, what they call a freely associated state. But there's always been a, a pro-Puerto Rican uh, independence movement on the island Although it's very small, um, there have been four plebiscites in Puerto Rico, and in each one of them, the, the people that want total independence have only showed up as 5% of the voting populace there. All right, so the majority of the people want to remain associated with the United States. Either they want to remain in, in what they call the freely associated status, which is they are an independent country, but they are freely associated with the United States and therefore maintain their U.S. citizenship, or they want to become a state of the United States. Oh, okay. So basically the opposite of the desire of the FALN. Absolutely. The FALN's uh, uh, philosophy of, of total independence is just not widely accepted anywhere on the island. And would you call the FALN a terrorist group? No and question you... about it. In, in, in fact, they are the most prolific terrorist group that the United States has ever seen. They did over 112 bombings incendiary or incendiary attacks. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit more about those attacks? You know what? Before we even start that, why don't we go all the way back and just give me a brief rundown of when you joined the FBI, why you joined the FBI, and your connection to Puerto Rico. Okay. Well, I, I became a clerical employee in the FBI in 1967, and it was just, uh, I just got lucky. There was an FBI agent in the uh, church congregation that I belonged to, and um, I was just a high school graduate and looking for a job. And in those days, there were, of course, no computers, and there was a huge clerical staff in the FBI. So I got a job in the FBI office in Chicago, put myself through school, did my military service, and six years later I applied for and became an agent in 1973. In 1974, I was transferred to New York. And um, in 1974, October 1974, the FALN first emerged their first bombings. They did five simultaneous bombings in New York City. Um, I wasn't part of that investigation at that point in time. In December of 1974, they targeted a New York City police officer by calling in a complaint that there was a dead body inside of a, an abandoned apartment building in Spanish Harlem. And what they had done is they had rigged a bomb on the door so that when somebody pushed open the door, the, the bomb would go off. The And that's exactly what happened. The, the responding police officer went up the steps, pushed open the door, and the bomb went off, blowing him back out into the street. He lost an eye. He suffered other damage. What was one of the real ironies of that was his name was Angel Poggi, and he was a Puerto Rican himself. And it was his first complete week on the job as a New York police officer. Wow. Then in 1975, January 1975, the FALN did their largest bombing, which was they put down a bomb at Francis Tavern in New York City. And Francis is a historical building. It's where George Washington gave his farewell to the Continental Army address. 
uh, was used as a recruiting office for the Continental Army. And they put down a bomb that went off at about one in the afternoon, killing four and wounding about 60 people. And at that point, the FBI formed a new squad to investigate those bombings. And they wanted young volunteers, and I raised my hand, and that's how I got involved in all this. Now, did you actually work in the San Juan office also? Yes. I, I worked in New York for three years, and at that point in time, somebody at FBI headquarters thought that the origin of the FALM was probably in Puerto Rico, and they were looking for someone that was willing to go to Puerto Rico and work the cases there. And, again, I raised my hand. I had uh, scored well enough on the aptitude test to, to take language school. So I went through language school and then went to Puerto Rico, and I lived there for three years. I thought that you had been assigned to Puerto Rico, and that's where you became interested and began investigating the FALN. But you actually were transferred to Puerto Rico for that purpose. That's exactly correct. Wow. So you were definitely dedicated to this investigation. And I guess that's why you're considered one of the FBI's experts in the FALN. Uniquely, I, I ended up doing um, not only New York and San Juan, but then I went to Chicago where I arrived there shortly after 11 FALN members had been captured in a Chicago suburb, Evanston, Illinois. And I assisted with preparing for prosecution of those people. And then there was one individual amongst those 11 that decided to cooperate. His name was Freddie Mendez, and the supervisor on the squad assigned several of us to speak with Freddie, and I ended up being one of those key people that spent literally hundreds and hundreds of hours speaking to Freddie Mendez. Now, before this, had the FBI or any law enforcement been able to get an informant or a cooperating witness that was a member of the FALN? No, unfortunately, there was really um, a complete lack of understanding of the FALN, and there was no ability to penetrate the organization. Now, my view, the, part of this is because while there was a vocal uh, community of people that were pro-independent, in both Chicago and New York, they were exercising their First Amendment rights, basically. And as you know, um, under the Privacy Act of 1974, the, the FBI could not investigate any of those people unless there was some sort of nexus to an actual crime. And there was no real connection that we could show between those organizations, uh, the Movimiento de Liberación Nacional, for example, MLN, with the FALN, and since we couldn't show that, we couldn't investigate these people, we couldn't send informants against them, we couldn't wiretap, we couldn't do any of those investigative steps that you might expect would go on. And so Freddy Menendez was a catch. It was a, He was definitely a key to learning as much as you could about the FALN membership. Well, that's correct. Uh, it, Freddie Mendez, uh, he had been only an, an FALM member for a little over six months when he was captured. And so when he started talking to us, he had no clue as to any other members other than the people he had been captured with. He had no idea of any location that we hadn't already found. But what made Freddie very valuable was the fact that he was able to tell us how the FALM operated and we discovered that they were much more sophisticated than we ever dreamt. Wow. So why did he cooperate? I mean, you've, all through the years, you, you were unable to find anybody who would cooperate, and now you have Freddie Mendez. What was his motivation? Freddie Mendez was, was an individual, a young man, who was uh, very concerned about social justice. And, in fact, within within the FALN, once he became an FALN member, uh, they used to call him the, the PSP, which stands for the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, because he wanted social justice. Um, he had been a member of the MLN, uh, which is kind of like a, 
again, a support organization for the FALN. And uh, he was recruited from there. And he, once he became an FALN member and participated in some of their actions, he thought that they were not accomplishing the goals that he thought they were going to be trying to accomplish. And he wanted out. And um, he didn't know what to do because he was afraid that if he just said, I want out, that they would um, attack him or attack his family. So he was very uncertain as to, to what exactly to do. He was sentenced to 75 years uh, on the federal bench, from the federal bench. and uh, For six months of participation? That's correct. Right. And it was several 20-year consecutive sentences. And so while in prison with these other individuals, they felt badly for him, and they were telling him some of the things that they had done. They said, we know that you weren't part of this, but here's some of the things that we did. You know, and we're, we're hoping that when we get out of prison, we can do these again. And he thought this was all kind of crazy. And so he took a gamble. And mind you, it was a big risk for him because he had been told by the FALN members that if you speak to the government, they're either going to kill you or they're going to record what you say and edit it so that it sounds like you're saying something completely different and put that out in the community. Um, so he was he was very fearful of that. And so fearful that when we first started speaking with him, he would not speak. It was all by exchange of notes. I would like for you to add a little bit more about the defense or lack of defense that was offered during the court proceedings and why he was lumped in with everybody else. Well, during the court proceedings, he, uh, again, uh, he was fearful of, of his fellow FALM members. So he, and he did not know anything about how to approach the government, but he did want out. Now, in terms of their uh, not putting out a defense, actually they, their defense, their argument was that they were prisoners of war, that Puerto Rico was at war with the United States. And therefore, they should have been tried in an international court and that the whole proceedings uh, should not go on. That, that was the position that they took. And as a result, they did not defend themselves. They had standby counsel. So if they did want to speak, and in some cases they did, um, they could. But the bottom line is they put on no real defense. And so at no time did Freddy Mendez go before the court and say, you know, I've only been involved in six months and I have not participated in any acts that have resulted in, you know, a loss of life or, or, or maiming. That is correct. However, uh, Freddie Mendez reached out for the U.S. government after being convicted, but prior to being sentenced. So when he reached out initially, he didn't know how many years he was going to get. And he reached out for uh, the prosecutor uh, of the FALM, which was Jeremy Margolis at the time, uh, who had taken a great deal of interest in these cases and understood them very well and, and worked well with the investigators. And um, he contacted Margolis, and Margolis, it was only a few days before sentencing was set, Margolis could only say to him at that point in time, look, if you you know, are sincere about this and can, you know, want to cooperate, we can work with you. But if you have blood on your hands, if you're one of those people that was involved in anything where people were injured or killed, then we don't want to have anything to do with you. And um, Mendez, and again, this is all by exchange of notes, mind you, <laughs> because Mendez didn't want to speak. He was so fearful. Um, but Mendez came back and said, well, what do I do at sentencing? And Margolis said, just act like, you know, your peers would expect you to act. And that's exactly what Mendez did, and he ended up with a 75-year sentence. And I take it at that point, now he's even more motivated to cooperate, um, hoping Absolutely. that the government will, will help him out with that sentencing. Yeah, well, Men Mendez, I, I don't think any of these people are not intelligent, but Mendez, I think, has a, a great deal of acumen. 
And uh, so he spent a little time in the in the prison library, found out that there was such a thing as a witness protection program, found out that, that he could get a, a public defender to file an appeal, uh, that sort of thing. And that's how he proceeded. And uh, originally he did have a public defender that filed an appeal. Um, FALN supporters came to him in prison and got him to withdraw that appeal initially. And then he again reached out for Margolis, and uh, Margolis said, you know, to himself, I've got to get this guy out of prison because he's obviously very scared. And so he moved him into a federal facility from a state facility, which separated him basically from all the other FALM members. Why don't you explain that to me about the state facility? So initially, this group was prosecuted un- under a state violation. How come well, it wasn't the federal? So when the FALM members were captured in Evanston, Illinois, they were in possession of stolen vehicles. Uh, in fact, one vehicle had just been stolen in a confrontational armed robbery, uh, a U-Haul truck, and uh, several illegal weapons. So there were state violations that could be charged. In terms of the federal case, the federal case would involve seditious conspiracy, which is a uh, conspiracy to carry out war against, acts of war against the United States government. Margolis recognized that there would be um, a lot of time needed to put together the seditious conspiracy case. And, of course, there's a little bit of politics here. The, the U.S. or the, uh, district attorney in, in, uh, Cook County wanted to prosecute these things because it would be very high profile for him. So Margolis and he agreed that they would proceed with state charges first. And that would give him, Margolis, the breathing room to put together the federal case for seditious conspiracy. So what happened here is that they were prosecuted on the weapons and, and vehicle charges first uh, and sentenced under state law, and then they had to confront the federal prosecution for seditious conspiracy. Okay. So you have 11 people that are now tried, convicted, sentenced. You've got them. Well, not completely. We had identified other FALM members, um, Oscar Lopez being one who was not captured, and he was uh, viewed as an FALM leader. Uh, William Morales, who had blown himself up in an FALM bomb factory in uh, New York City in Queens. And both of these were at large, and we knew that they were probably not going to give up. They weren't just going to go away. You're kind of like almost in a race to identify the people uh, that are still out there that are most likely planning more acts, terrorist acts. Exactly. Precisely. Okay. The risk factor has not uh, has not completely gone away. I mean, we, we may have injured them, but we have no idea how many FALM members there are. For example, amongst the 11 that were captured, we knew like four of them. And the rest of them, we had no idea that they were FALM members. Your your goal is to get as much information as you can about who's still out there. And the fact that Freddie Mendez is now willing to talk is something that's very exciting for you. He cannot, again, point towards individuals that he knows are part of the FALN or places that they use. But what he can do is provide the intelligence as to how they operate. And that becomes a key factor here. The the uh, sequence of events basically is that the FALM members captured in Evanston are, are convicted federally uh, and sentenced. And that's in 1981, late 81. Uh, but on uh, uh, almost a year later, on New Year's Eve 1982, the FALN puts down five bombs in New York City And those five bombs injured three New York City police officers. One lost a leg from the knee down. Two of them lost uh, body parts, uh, vision, 
fingers, that sort of thing. There were bomb techs trying to disarm a bomb. And um, all of that showed us that the FALN had not gone away. Is there a particular reason that they're directing their attacks at police officers? Well, no, not really. They were directing them at, um, of, of course, the police as a government agency. And the officer who lost his leg, the, the device was put down in front of uh, one police plaza at New York City, which is police headquarters. Uh, the other ones were trying to disarm a bomb at a different location. But it was primarily targeting government agencies, whether they're uh, city or state or federal. Uh, it, the place where the two bomb technicians were injured, uh, there were people walking through. It was a plaza, and people were walking through the plaza that didn't speak English, and the police officers actually physically picked up these people and carried them away from where the device had been found. So yeah, you're putting people in harm's way absolutely all the time. Okay, and we see that very often in both domestic and international terrorism where they really don't seem to care who uh, is harmed by their uh, their attacks. Correct. I, th- I think, um, and mind you, I, uh, this is purely just opinion, but I have um, a lifetime bas- basically invested in these types of investigations. And I think the, the people that are perpetrating a lot of these acts are motivated by their own ego. They just want to do as much damage as they possibly can and, you know, maybe get their names remembered for doing that, going down as a martyr. And it doesn't matter whether it's the FALN or Columbine. It's all kind of the same psychological point of view, I think, on the part of the perpetrators. So now you have five new bombings in New York. In what direction did this investigation now go? Well, um, over the year prior to that, um, we had taken the information that Freddie Mendes had given us about how the FALN operated, and we had targeted a suspect, suspected FALN member in Chicago with very sophisticated, very manpower intensive, by the way, uh, physical surveillances, and he had led us to an apartment that was rented in a false name. Um, where we know he was meeting with the stepmother of one of the FALN leaders, uh, Carlos Torres' stepmother, her name, Alejandrina Torres. And we suspected that this was an FALN safe house based on how it operated, how they traveled to and from the safe house or the apartment, and, uh, you know, comparing that with the information provided by Mendez as to how they operated and how they trained him, we firmly believed that this was an FLN safe house, but we were kind of stuck in terms of having probable cause to search this place or get a wiretap on this place because we simply did not have an insider, no undercover agent, no informant that could tell us about this specific location. So what do you do? Well, Margolis kind of uh, came up with a bit of genius, in my in my opinion, and he said, let's make an empirical argument. Freddie Mendez was an FALN member. He was taught how to do these things. These are the things that he was trained to do as an FALN member. This is how they operated their safe houses. And now we have almost a year's worth of surveillance of an individual. We know how he does counter-surveillance techniques. We know that he goes to this apartment rented in a false name. We know that they have meetings there. He meets with someone there. And all this matches up with Freddie Mendes' description of how the FALN operates. And therefore, we believe that this is an FALN safe house. And we were able to get the Department of Justice and the FBI to approve uh, Title III, which is a basically placing microphones in the apartment as a result. That's big. At this point now, you don't need to have an insider. You don't need to have an undercover because you're actually in there. You're hearing uh, exactly what's going on. What kind of information are you getting from this uh, wiretap? 
Well, um, mind you, some of this was a little difficult um, for several reasons. First of all, they're speaking Spanish and they're speaking a Puerto Rican dialect, and uh, they're playing music in the background, which makes it very difficult to hear. But the bottom line is is that we discover various plots they're working on uh, over a period of months, one being a plot to uh, cause the escape of an FALN leader, Oscar Lopez, who was at that time incarcerated at Leavenworth Prison. To break him out of prison? Well, we we didn't know exactly what it was because, again, we, there was all kinds of interference and it isn't like we could get a clear conversation or uh, dialogue that would clearly dis- describe all this. But uh, ultimately, what we discovered was that there was uh, they were talking about guards, they were talking about an ambulance, uh, they were talking about a hospital, and what we put together by taking all these little pieces, these little puzzle pieces, is that Oscar Lopez was to be transported from Leavenworth to Wadsworth VA Hospital in uh, Kansas, where he would be treated on a particular day. And uh, we verified that with the warden. And basically, we stopped it and intervened and uh, prevented him from traveling there, but also uh, then conducted the surveillance at that location and identified our Chicago subjects in the area of the hospital uh, ambulance entrance, uh, obviously in disguises, and uh, apparently preparing to take that ambulance down and uh, cause the escape of Oscar Lopez. So that was big. I mean, you've probably saved the lives of the ambulance workers and the guards that were accompanying him. There's, there's no question. I mean, there's co- parts of the conversation that we were able to discern that said, you, you, basically, you've got to be ready to shoot goal was to identify as many FALM members as we possibly could. So we simply surveilled them, let them return to Chicago, which was their base of operations. One of them was uh, based out of Puerto Rico, uh, although we were unable to successfully surveil him back to Puerto Rico to identify him fully. But no, our, our goal was to swim upstream, so to speak, to identify more FALM members and the leadership of the FALM. So as far as they were concerned, they don't know why the transfer, he was not transferred to the hospital, just for some reason it didn't go off the way they had hoped it would. That's correct. They didn't, they didn't understand exactly what had happened, but for what, whatever reason, he was not transferred as he expected he would be. Um, it, it, it seemed to be just kind of a capricious decision by the warden. We identified a second safe house in Chicago. We identified the apartment that they had rented in uh, Kansas City that they intended to use as a safe house to to uh, um, keep Lopez in until things kind of cooled down. And the next thing that kind of happened was they talked about um, perhaps breaking some of the state FALM members, the FALM members in state custody, out of their prisons. So um, basically. And mind you, we had an ad hoc task force that had uh, state police on, on it, and they just arranged for the State Department of Corrections to rotate these people, which effectively disrupted all plans for them to break these people out. In terms of how we were working the case in Chicago, the Secret Service, after the arrest of the FALN members in Evanston, Illinois, had started having uh, weekly or monthly, rather, um, conferences with the state intelligence people and the Chicago police intelligence people because amongst things that had been discovered in the arrest of the FALN 11 in Evanston, Illinois, there had been a safe house for FALN leader Carlos Torres in New Jersey that seemed to have plans for an attack on the Democratic National Convention. And at that point in time, the FALN had already taken over uh, the offices of Carter Mondale in Chicago 
and George Bush in New York City uh, put campaign workers down on the floor uh, at gunpoint, uh, raided the office, basically going through their files, stealing lists of delegates to the various conventions, and sending threat letters to those delegates. So the Secret Service obviously had a big concern, and they wanted to keep in touch with the various intelligence organizations, both in New York and in Chicago. When uh, I had spoken to Freddie Mendez and came to understand how the FALN operated, I went to Bill Dyson, who was a, a agent on the squad who was far more experienced in domestic terrorism than I was at that point, um, and said, look, I think we can probably take a suspect to a safe house but it's going to require massive manpower. I mean, very discreet surveillance. And I don't know where to get that. And he said, go to one of these intelligence meetings that the Secret Service is holding and see if you could recruit the people. And that's exactly what happened. I went to the next intelligence meeting. I stood up and said, I think that we could find identify an FALN member and find a safe house if we all work together. And people raised their hands. A sergeant by the name of Marty Barrett from the Chicago Police Intelligence Unit, uh, people from the state of Illinois Intelligence and Secret Service all said, we're in, tell us what you need. And that's how the, this all started. And it became, without without the approval of so much as a line supervisor, we just started working together. And um, that's how this case was worked. And it was so successful that after the case was, after, after the arrests were made in the case, then the FBI formalized it as a task force and started providing funding to the state and city for overtime providing vehicles, providing radios, that sort of thing. So it really became a, a joint terrorist task force at that point. But up until that point, when this case was actually being worked, it was all ad hoc. In New York, Ken Walton, who is one of the assistant directors of the New York office, had formed a joint terrorist task force in 1982. Is this one of the very first ones? That was the first one. You were working together, but it was not a formalized, JTTF, like the New York one. That's correct. Okay. All right. So what are you guys doing? You're trying to identify this new safe house. You're trying to identify new members. I take it you're conducting a lot of surveillance. There's surveillance on safe houses, some surveillances on the, the residences and or uh, places of employment of identified members. Um, and all this, you know, requires a lot of manpower. If you do 16 hours a day, for example, on one location, you, you've got to have four or five people at that location. So now we're talking about five, six different locations. You know, one safe house, then another safe house, then, you know, three or four different sus suspects or subjects and the bottom line is is that you start eating manpower like crazy. Um, you, it takes um, about 12 people to run a single five-man shift, a single five-man shift seven days a week. Well, how was management feeling about this? I mean, you've got other cases, I take it, <laughs> that need to be investigated, and your case is eating up all this manpower. Well, no question about it, but it was it was joint manpower, and, and frankly, everyone was so excited about the fact that we had penetrated this. And mind you, in the law enforcement um, history, one of the defenses that had been raised in cases like this was, was that uh, there were agent provocateurs because either you had undercover agents or you had informants. This case from a law enforcement perspective, was unique in that it did not have either informants or undercover agents, and therefore the argument that this was agent provocateur uh, that was 
provoking all this uh, couldn't be made. So, they, so basically, they couldn't say that they were framed, that it was a setup. Pre- precisely. They could not say that this was a setup, that the whole thing was the government's idea somehow. And, and uh, that, along with the fact that I think everyone realized that these people were still a threat, that they could do bombing. I mean, they had gotten so bold that they had, like I said, gone into um, the offices of campaigns, Carter Mondale in Chicago, George W. Bush. They had put down campaign workers on the floor at gunpoint. They had raided the offices and then had the audacity to send out threat letters and even made some phone calls to some of the delegates to the conventions. In one case, they showed, they sent a letter with a picture of that person's home and they talked about killing people, agents and prosecutors. Because they are a clandestine organization, you have no idea when they might attack. And the objective here is to stop this as soon as possible to protect the American public. Because you never know what the next target might be. Uh, one of the things that Freddie Mendes revealed to us was that they, the FALN, had examined the possibility of kidnapping Ronald Reagan Jr., who at the time lived in New York and was an entertainer, and they had actually staked out and done surveillances on his the brownstone that he lived in, and they actually had paced off the distance from his front steps, basically, to the next intersection to figure out how long it would take them to grab him as he went up the steps and hustle him into a van and spirit him away. So I can imagine that the Secret Service is very much a part of uh, stopping that scheme. And very much interested in in, uh, checking the veracity of it, which they did by doing a polygraph of Freddie Mendez, uh, which he passed with flying colors. Okay, okay. All right, so, yeah, definitely this investigation, you must have had everybody, you know, from headquarters of all of these agencies and all of these departments looking at you saying, what are you guys doing? You know, what's the progress? You know, what's happening? I, I, yeah, that, were you under were you under a lot of pressure? Um, I didn't see it that way at the time, but I was a much younger man. That <laughs> um, I, I just saw it as you know we need to continue to uh, press on and, and you know take this opportunity that we've done, had before. You know we've now we, we've got a window into this clandestine organization. Let's exploit it for all that it is worth. And that was my attitude. And, um, in fact, uh, amongst other things, FBI headquarters, for example, wanted daily briefings. Um, and I didn't have the time. I was not going to sit on the phone with these guys day after day giving them briefings. And what I had is a Chicago cop by the name of Kurt Blanc, um, who did that for me because I just wanted to make sure all, I, I just want to make sure everything was taken care of. And uh, one of the key things here was communication. And I can't underemphasize the necessity for great communication amongst different agencies and different entities within an agency. And Bill Dyson, um, FBI agent, was great in that he created daily summaries that were disseminated to everyone so that it didn't matter if you were a guy working surveillance for the Chicago Police Department as part of this or you were the U.S. Attorney, Jeremy Margolis, everyone got the same daily briefing, which was just fabulous in terms of, you know, understanding how the pieces all fit together and how important it was to keep that going all the time. Hey, Rick, when I asked you about pressure and you said you didn't feel it, well, when it comes to daily briefings, that's the definition of pressure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't do them, and I didn't do them only because I thought I had other better things to do than to talk to Buck Ravel at the time, who was the assistant director in charge of terrorism, 
and, uh, and mind you, I respect Buck, and, uh, you know, Buck knows me and I know him, but the bottom line is, is I didn't think I needed to be there feeding them that, that information. And it wasn't, I mean, some people may have wanted to do that because they wanted, quote, the FaceTime, unquote, but that wasn't where I was going. I was going towards let's get as much out of this as we possibly can, and I needed to make sure that my peers, sergeant from the state police, sergeant from the Chicago Police Department, uh, agents from the Secret Service, all were attended to and attended to by me. And that was a much more important thing because I wanted that, I wanted them to sense that there was that relationship that they could count on me, they could tell me anything, tell me if they had a problem, tell me if, they, tell me if some FBI agent somehow uh, made them angry. I wanted to know about that. So uh, I, I kept up that part of the relationship. How long is this part of the investigation, these extensive uh, surveillances of these safe houses. We started the or, original surveillances of our suspect in December of 1981. In August of 1982, he had taken us through all kinds of counter surveillance techniques to an apartment that he rented in a bogus name. We actually have him purchasing the money order to pay the rent on this thing by that time. We find him meeting with Alejandrina Torres at that apartment uh, after the bombings on, in uh, New Year's Eve 1982. We get a Title III, which starts up in January of 1983. And between January and June, we discover three other safe houses. We identify other people. We stop the escape of Oscar Lopez. We stop the escape of other FLM members in state custody. We find the information that results in the capture of FLM member William Morales in Mexico. And ultimately in June of 1983, uh, while they're plotting to put down bombs in Chicago, we disrupt that and make arrests. How many people? Only four. And it's kind are, these, of are these leaders? Are, do, would you categorize these, these four people as leaders? I would categorize only Alejandrina Torres as being an FLN leader. I think everyone else are foot soldiers in all of this, and that's the big disappointment. And the proof is kind of in the pudding. Of you know, we had literally hundreds of hours of um, audio tape recorded, and amongst the conversations in those audio tapes, there are over 100 nom de guerre, false names, that are mentioned that we never identified. Mm -hmm. So this is a big organization with lots of people, and it's not very different, in fact, from large drug cartels. Uh, you know, the, the DEA agents, I know, have kind of gone through the same sort of thing, where you have gnomes de guerre or you know, phony names being used, code words being used, and, you know, you, the frustration is you're not able to identify them, and therefore you're not able to produce an affidavit that would allow you to go forward with some sort of investigation. All right, so you've arrested these four people. I take it they're tried and convicted? Correct. 55 years each, uh, with the exception of Jose... Rodriguez, who I think only got five years and it was suspended because he was uh, much like Freddie Mendez, a, a brand new recruit. Okay. So what happens after this? I mean, I haven't heard of any FALN terrorist attacks in well, recent after, history. After the, after the uh, 1982 New Year's Eve bombings, there has never been another FALN bombing. There was subsequently in 1985, uh, Oscar Lopez, uh, recruited inmates inside the prison to assist him in yet another escape plot. Uh, one of the people that he recruited in the prison came to authorities who turned it over to the FBI and, and again we, we constructed a case that allowed them to 
but basically uh, in, uh, uh, inculpate themselves so that uh, the, he was prosecuted along with others for uh, conspiracy to s- escape from prison and sentenced to another 15 years. Other than that, beyond that, there's never been another FALN act. Are they still active as far as the rhetoric? Um, There's still rhetoric on the island in particular uh, that's supportive of the FALN. And mind you, in the Puerto Rican community, there's lots of people that sympathize with uh, the concept of uh, Puerto Rican independence. You know, they are a minority, and I think every minority feels that at some point in time that they have suffered some sort of prejudice. And uh, as a result, there's that, that emotive kind of thing going on. And so people that say, well, you know, I've been mistreated as a Puerto Rican. And, geez, you know, I, I sympathize with these guys. I, I, you know, I believe in the fact that they stood up against the government and stood up against, the, you know, the white Americans sort of, sort of thing. What about the innocent people that were harmed? It, was anybody well, actually killed? Oh, yes, there are five people killed. Okay. Yes. And then people and that were just horribly disfigured. Several people horribly disfigured, yes. I mean, upwards of 60 people. And so what do the sympathizers think about that? Well, you know, in the public forum, that's never brought up. In fact, amongst the FALN members and their supporters, you never hear the name Freddie Mendez either. He's the one that disappeared because they couldn't believe that he would turn on them as he, you know, from their perspective, he did. So um, there's no accounting for that. And, in fact, Oscar Lopez, after everyone else had been released, and mind you, in 1999, there were 12 members that were released as a result of offer of clemency by then-President uh, William Jefferson Clinton. And oddly enough, that offer of clemency came within days of Hillary Clinton uh, declaring her, basically her run for the Senate. So, and that was a year and a half before the Clintons left office, mind you. So it, it, it wasn't one of those 11th hour sort of things. So it sounds uh, like you think there was a political purpose uh, for that clemency? That's my belief. I believe it was basically designed to get the Puerto Rican vote for Hillary Clinton in her Senate run. There's three and a half million Puerto Ricans in New York. Some of the New York Congress people are very uh, pro-independence, have been supporters of the FALN, and they were, in fact, the people that lobbied the Clinton administration to provide clemency to these people. Um, saying saying things like the sentence was outrageous, uh, that it wouldn't be the same under the current sentencing guidelines, which is not true, um, and you know that they never harmed anyone, which is not true. So people that had a 55-year sentencing served approximately 15 years. Well, no, they they served a little bit longer than that. They served from uh, 19 their capture in 1980 either in state or federal custody, until their release in 1999. Okay. So it's 19 years. Well, I could see as a, as the investigator, you know, who sat there in court and heard them get their sentencing, um, or sentences, um, you know, would be extremely disappointed in uh, them being released early. You know, um, it wasn't so much that disappointment. It was the disappointment that the government didn't get anything in return. There was no cooperation. As an interesting aside, after all the other FALM members were released, Oscar Lopez, for the first time in 2011, came up for parole. The first time he applied for parole. And um, the victims were notified by me, not by the government. And they jointly decided to go to the 
parole hearing in Terre Haute, Indiana. And they talked amongst themselves before they went into that hearing. And they said, you know, if this guy just says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the damage done, I'm sorry for the things that we did, I'm sorry for your families, they all agreed that they would say, fine, cut them loose. But Oscar Lopez did not do that. Oscar Lopez refused to acknowledge his role in the FALN, and he refused to say he was sorry. In an earlier interview, a few years before that, he had said, I have a problem with contrition. Um, so, the, you know, that's in part and parcel what uh, all of this is about in terms of wanting to provide some sort of relief for somebody that's incarcerated. The FALM members that were released in 1999 did not petition for clemency. And normally that's a requirement of the Department of Justice is that the individual has to say, I'm sorry and I am petitioning for clemency. None of them did. And yet the Department of Justice and the Clinton administration allowed them to be processed and released without ever signing a petition for clemency. You know, it's important to to people to understand about the justice system and how sometimes it doesn't necessarily work the way you think it should work. So tell us, what what ever happened to to Freddie Mendez? Freddie Mendez, uh, his 75-year sentence was a a result of several consecutive 20-year sentences. We got the judge... Uh, who was not willing to withdraw the sentences at all. Uh, you know, no judge wants to stand corrected, especially by himself. <laughs> but uh, what he did is he consolidated them in, into concurrent. And uh, so Freddie did uh, less than 10 years in prison. I don't know where he's at today, but I understand that he is a professional and has worked in continuing community service for minorities. Okay. So, Did he get into the uh, witness protection program? or? He, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. No, he, from, from the time he started to cooperate, we put him into the witness security program. Okay. And uh, and he uh, has a, a new identity to this day. And again, I don't know where he is. I don't know what name he uses. Um, but I wish him the best because I, I think he was, he was just, not different from maybe some Somali teenager living in the Minneapolis area today who just kind of said, you know, this is not right, and I want social justice. And, gee, how do I do that? And he was recruited by people that said violence is the way. And in a democracy, violence really has no place. That's my view. Absolutely. So what is the state of Puerto Rican independence? The independence movement in Puerto Rico still exists. There's that that uh, segment of the population that is very vociferous about it. Uh, however, in the last plebiscite, which I believe was in 2015, the majority of people voted for statehood. And so I would expect that there will be... Um, both the introduction of a statehood bill for Puerto Rico in the U.S. Congress in 2017, and uh, that may very well fire up more resistance on the island amongst those that are pro-independence. I've written two books on the FALM. One is just basically the history of uh, the bombings uh, titled Terror's Dawn, and uh not nearly as interesting as the investigation where we actually penetrated the FALN, which is called American Terrorists. And that book I plan to publish this summer. There's also a movie being produced, a documentary, about um, the FALN investigations. So will you promise to let me know when that book is published and give us more information about where we could see this documentary? I, uh, Jerry, it would be my pleasure. I would also point out that the documentary is being made by the producer and director of Blackfish, which if you are not familiar with that at all, 
It was about the orca whales used at SeaWorld. It played at Sundance. Uh, the, the gentleman's name is Manny Ortesa. Uh, and, and he, uh, you know, he's a documentary producer and director. He and I have become friends and he decided to go ahead and do a, a production on the FALN based on the books. So uh, that hopefully will come out this summer. All right. Well, just uh, keep us posted. It sounds like this FALN case was a major investigation for you. So when it ended, I mean, what did you do next? Well, after the FALN case, I was happy to see a formalization of the second terrorist task force ever founded in the United States, which was Chicago. I worked with other agents working various cases that that entity saw the terrorism task force for the next couple of years. And then in 1987, I was invited to become an examiner in the FBI Laboratory Explosives Unit, which I did, and I traveled all over the world in response to explosive attacks against U.S. interests. Uh, Pan Am 103, for example, or the, the bombing of an Avianca air, airliner in Colombia. And uh, then in 1993, I raised my hand again and became the SSRA in Long Beach, California, which is where I retired. Um, just had a wonderful, wonderful career, uh, all exciting, all fun stuff, and uh, fortunately was pretty successful and have great friends both in the FBI and in other communities in law enforcement. So when did you retire and what are you doing now? I retired in 1999. I run my own company, consulting firm. I do things like vulnerability assessments. Uh, I have taught at Eastern Kentucky University as a lecturer full-time. And I do teaching and consulting with State Department. Very good. So I'm going to give you the last word. You can take this opportunity to sum up your investigation or sum up your career. What would you like to say? Um, I would like to say this, that uh, out there in today's world, there's all kinds of frustration by people and the unfortunate fact of the matter is, is that there are organizations out there, ISIS, Al Qaeda, you name it, uh, Aryan nations for that matter, that would recruit those frustrated people and compel them to engage in violence. And that's really the, the social problem that we need to address, in my view. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos and links to newspaper articles about the case. There's that FBI files video that you want to check out. If you enjoyed the interview, please share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you. At the bottom of the episode show notes, you'll find all the social media share buttons. I do have a crime fiction recommendation for you. It is The End of Watch by Stephen King. Yes, that's Stephen King. In an earlier episode, I recommended his other two novels in this crime fiction series, Mr. Mercedes and Finder's Keepers. I really enjoy those first two novels because they stayed close to the crime fiction genre. This last novel in the series, End of Watch, really dips into paranormal and horror. In this third book, End of Watch, Stephen King brings the Detective Bill Hodges trilogy to an end by combining the detective fiction of Mr. Mercedes and Finder's Keepers with a supernatural suspense paranormal twist, his trademark. But it was interesting, and I still recommend the whole trilogy. I mean, nobody can do it better than Stephen King, even when he does it with a little twist. One last thing before you go, let me tell you a little bit more about that March Milestone giveaway that I'm featuring this month. You'll have a chance to win a signed copy of Pay to Play, my crime novel, Along with that will be a display ornament celebrating female FBI agents, 
a Philadelphia FBI challenge coin, a Philadelphia FBI lapel pin, FBI retired case file review and pay to play bookmarks. As you can see, there's a theme to this female FBI agent assigned in the Philadelphia division, which is of course my story. I just want to make sure you understand that all of these FBI collectibles that I am making available for this contest can't be purchased anywhere. You have to know a current or retired FBI employee in order to get your hands on one. And lucky for you, you know one. So good luck with the contest. The contest closes at 12 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday, March 31st, 2017. And the rules are simple. Anyone who signs up or has already signed up for my monthly newsletter will be automatically entered. I'm going to pick two winners. I have two prize packages. The winner will be announced in the April newsletter. One entry per subscriber. You're automatically entered. It's open worldwide. All entrants must be 18 or older. The winner will be drawn at random and there is no cash alternative. The newsletter is sent out once a month. In it, I make it easy for you to review episode show notes, photos, crime recommendations, links to FBI books written by FBI agents featured on the podcast. And I provide updates on the FBI in books, TV and movies and my own author journey. So I invite you to subscribe to my monthly newsletter. And I also invite you to review FBI Retired Case File Review on iTunes. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again soon for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.